we come to you <laughs> with the blessing, support, funding of three different organizations, uh, Chax Press, POG, Inc., sometimes POG Poetry in Action, and the University of Arizona Poetry Center, which is a real pleasure. I think it's been a while since all three of those things have kind of come together at something like this. And I could thank about 40 people, I'm sure, but I'm just gonna thank all the supporters that contribute to any of those organizations. Well, I probably think 400 people. <laughs> um, you know, we are here because people are generous and care about these arts and, and it's, a, it's an honor to be here. We are also here on uh, lands that are the traditional um, lands of the Tahona Odom, have been lands of the Yaqui since early in the 20th century, and are the ancient lands of the Hokam. And I think we're extremely grateful and honored to be here knowing that as well, and knowing um, that history is highly contested. Also, I know for POG particularly, which does a lot more events than Chax Press, it's important to us that we are a safe space. And if anybody feels pushed, harassed, uh, made to feel uh, uncomfortable in any way, uh, please, uh, if we could do anything about it, if you're a POG board member, raise your hand or, or yes. So back there, Cynthia, Myself and David Weiss here. Okay. Usually I wing it, but for my friend Nathaniel Tarn, I decided to write something out. <laughs> Nathaniel Tarn, poet, anthropologist, book publisher, editor, traveler, friend. Born in France, raised in England, studied at Cambridge, the Sorbonne, Yale, London, the University of Chicago, where he received a PhD. Who has he known? Oh, my. Andre Breton, Salvador Dali, Pablo Neruda, Octavio Paz, Marcel Duchamp, Margot Fontaine, Charles Olson, Claude Levi Strauss, not to mention his many contemporaries who have read and celebrated his work from Robert Creeley to Nathaniel Mackey, Joseph Donahue, and on and on. He has lived much of the last half of the 20th century's arts and cultural work. He has lived that. And now, a couple decades in the current century, and he has created a good deal of it. He has indeed been more than one person, not always Nathaniel Tarn, not always a poet, but, but a poet for more years and books and throws, as he calls the parts of his autobiography, than anything else. In fact, in his recent study of his own past and present Atlantis and auto-anthropology, he examines the shape and meaning of a life. But then in book after book of poetry, that's one thing he has always done. And while I am not so familiar with his anthropological works, one would think that it is at the heart of what an anthropologist does, studies life and cultures of lives to find enduring truths about who a people were and are, perhaps with inclinations as to who we all are. Nathaniel Tarn finds out, following that principle of historine, Charles Olson celebrated, that is to find out for oneself. He also finds out, as he explains in Atlantis' preface, not just about a single subject, because we are profoundly contextual, meaning that we never seem to think of ourselves alone, but only in the context of the communities and societies in which we have lived at any given time. Thus, Atlantis is a profoundly unself-centered autobiography. One might even say it is a journey outward from self, and where else is there to go? As a poet, he has always been contemporary, perhaps because he believes, as he states in that autobiography, and against all the railing against changes in language practices over time, that 
A changing language is not necessarily a language in decadence. Yet it's also possible to say that in his lyric, his line, his diction, one can hear various past practice of poetry, of enunciation. For example, in the fairly early lyrics for the Bride of God, one hears, the earth was, was writhing in fire, the vast spine of earth lunged into the sky, head thrown back in an attitude of supplication, in which one might hear the visionary language of William Blake. Nathaniel Tarn told me a couple of days ago that he's never really been a literary critic and does not write about poetry as such do. Yet what he does write about poetry in his new book and in two past books of essays and conversations is as insightful as any such work I know. In the embattled lyric, for example, when he speaks of Paul Celan's work to push all forms of ambivalence to their uttermost states, to secure shots of the spectral analysis of things, no dream but a reality made of unabashed ambiguity, overlapping relationships, conceptual overlay. He gives us in one sentence all we need to dive into Salon's astounding poetic vision. Tarn's poems join past and present, philosophy and beauty, sometimes in a direct address, often to his partner and soulmate, Janet Rodney. In one of the poems to her in their collaborative book, Atitlan, Alashka, he writes, time of patience now, testing out our memory of roads once traveled further than night in an air of crystals where the breath is multifaceted as thought. Patience hunts the poem. The poem surrenders, opening a two-way mirror. Each life answers the other. So welcome tonight to these spaces where one might hear those crystal facets of thought in the poem, to these throes where one might hear one voice answering another, or many others, including your own. Welcome, Nathaniel Tarn. So, <clears throat> good evening. Thank you for showing up. I have rarely had as full and as elegant and as clear as an introduction as yours, senor. Thank you. I want a copy. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I've been fortunate enough this year to, uh, this year and a bit of last year, to have three books come out. And I decided to read from the first one, which uh, came out called The Hulilinii. Um It's published by New Directions, and I think it came out in March or something, I, I can never remember exactly when. Um, now this is, uh, this is tricky, okay? This is about uh, a very, very great poet of the 18th century. At least it's talking to him and he's talking to me. So we're talking about Friedrich Hüllelin uh, who was born near Dümigen in Germany, near Stuttgart, in 1770. He lost two fathers, one at age two and one at age nine. He had an extremely dominant mother uh, who wanted a Lutheran priest. And so she gave him that uh, education. He obeyed this until about 1778. He did his theology at Tübingen University. Um, 
He was interested, if you can imagine, they were around him in Klopstock, Schiller, Schelling, Goethe, Hegel, and his passion for the French Revolution, that is until, until Napoleon became an emperor, uh, all of that uh, was a part of him. He wanted to study law when he got out of the university. His mother nixed it. Uh, he went into tutoring children, which was the only uh, thing that men could do, apparently, um, if they did not go into the Lutheran uh, church. And so he got various jobs. Uh, and the major job in his life and in this poem, because this is actually one poem, although it is numbered into parts, uh, he fell immensely in love with the wife of his employer, as he said, whom he called Diotima after a platonic name, I think platonic, if I remember rightly. And of course, as a result of that, he was thrown out. She was also very much in love. He and she fell into great misery. Uh, Friedrich had no help from people in the literary career. And he uh, went on to produce his most important poems, the great hymns, as well as three versions of a tragedy, the death of Empedocles. Uh, he lived a bit in Stuttgart, trying to enter Suzette's garden and giving each other messages, but it, that didn't work terribly well. And uh, eventually he did some other jobs of that kind, but his mother won the game and he was never allowed to study law or anything that he wanted to do. He got less and less strength. And he spent 36 years of his life until death in 1843 in a tower uh, which belonged to a very fine gentleman worker in wood. He and his family gave Friedrich the best possible family life that he'd ever had. And so he stayed with them for 36 years. It took a hundred years for Helenin to be recognized not only as a great, perhaps the greatest German poet, but as the first modern poet to many cultures in the 20th century and beyond. This is number two, but that's not all that important. The lives that are being lived the lives out there that are being lived, we know not one entirely, not even just a part, one breath in the mountain air or the lowland air, one wish, one small desire, infinitesimal, foot loose below those heights. And so followed we are, trapped and condemned to these existences in the below. And how was it in those days then, those days so deeply buried? What were those others, those we call lives? What were they doing in this apparent motion, let's say this semblance of a life? There is a being sitting next to us, 
a being ardent, so packed with thoughts, wishes, desires, and fevers, it would take whole new inner lives to read, to comprehend. Multiply this by millions, reach down into the lower lives, the seabed lives, reach up into the upper lives, cloud lives, and tempest lives, and lives lived in the winging blue between the clouds when cloud-filled skies then empty out and there is nothing but the blue to wing one's way through and to cover heads. Those of the wondering to fill those heads with, oh, the information that we'll never read and never understand. Not that the past was understood, not that the present is, not that the future ever will be, and we'll be left so thoroughly alone, we'll be in danger of never waking up, we'll be so certain that we were born depressed, that from the start there was a flow of sadness we never could dig down to, and that whatever would desire to fill a space over the floor would lack in purity, would fail to mark, to manifest or fathom any happiness, would be the angel of destruction over any love. Poet, now lover has a pit he cannot fill and must look upward to those blue skies in which to find the naked likeness of a goddess living there that can make him a god. He does not know he cannot reach that. The multiplicity can only weigh him down. How now this very day among our days to make that incalculable fair number reach into one become a one? It must become, has to become the one, and then that one will in its turn form part of multiplicity, and there's no end to searching. Cannot be made in any sense into coherence, for that fair plural will itself become again part of the hymn up in her bosom. She has now abdicated her own divinity in joining him and all they own today is this, O oh, loving life illuminates duration. We have thought ever, endlessly, day after day, trying to reach that one beloved. She we have found, now there is hardly nothing left at all except to die. Hard to remember the joy of it, the ecstasy, the endless peering at that face, the one and only face now redefined as beauty. Oh, blissful creature, she stands there in the ruins of ages, and there, right there we stand, right there we are. We have become. The sense that this once found is, yes, indeed, the goddess, the she will fill this life and why not think it, may even walk well far beyond this life into whatever may be said to become after. Nature has now reached down into the leaves, the flowers, the crops, the sea, the rivers, marching to break infinity, the skies above them, shining down into the waters and filling them with life, a smiling life a laughter life to flavor all our days, to cushion them into old age. The life is sung at last, a singing satisfies. There is not even need of any listener. However, it would do, it would do splendidly if there were some assembly, some one community in which we would delight with love spread far and wide over the earth. Yes, they would grow in time and flourish, not leaving us behind. We do adore it. Uh, you, might, you might need to know that I was born depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
so this, these are bits, I'm afraid, because it's a very long piece. It's number 20. And um, I can't get it all in. <laughs> so um, it's from a major poem of his. Uh, and it's called As on a Holiday. As if on holiday, countrymen out one morning to visit his own fields, then out of a warm night, deep cooling flashes fall for hours, thunder still noises from a distance, the, the river falls into its banks again, new green sprouts from the soil and the vine drips with joyous rain, while gleaming in sunlight, our trees stand in the grove. A half of life with golden pears now ripe and fields full of wild roses hanging down the country, bathing in the lake, Oh, you sweet swans, as drunk with kisses, you bend down your heads into the sacred lake. How sad I am. Where find, when is it winter flowers, and where's the sun's clarity and shadows of the earth? The walls stand high and noiseless in the cold, the wind vain screech, and you are asking where they are. In song, their spirit travels when from day's sun and from warm earth it grows and storms in air and others more evolved within the depths of time, fuller of meaning and easier to hear for us, drift on between heaven and earth and amid the peoples, they are the thoughts of the communal spirit, and quiet they come down to rest in poets' souls. Desolate now is my house, and not only she have they taken, no, but my own two eyes. I've lost myself in losing her, which is why lost I live like in wandering phantom lives I fear, and all the rest has long meant nothing to me. Suzette had died much, much, much too early. In the uh, poem Menon Diotima, The Fates Reverse, come, it was like a dream, wings, Wounds have healed, and hope leaps out upon the restoration of your youth. Let those who wish to serve in Orcus serve in the underworld. We who were formed by love in silence will look for the instruction of the gods. Here is the state of healing. Only the healed can move to the celestials. And at the end, our man is healed, having aborted both the imagination and the elegiac. He can then go full force into his greatest hymns. And out of this, the sons of earth without attendant danger now drink heavenly fire. Yet, fellow poets, we need to stand bareheaded under those thunderstorms to grasp the Father's ray, no less with our own hands, and covering in song the heaven's gift to give us to our people. For if it happens, we are pure in heart as children, and our hands are free, a Father's ray, the pure, will not inflame our hearts and deeply riven, sharing his sufferings, 
he's stronger than we are, yet in the far-flung, down-rushing storm of the divine, when he draws near, the hearts will find within itself to stand in invulnerable. But, oh, my shame, when, oh, my shame, and let it be say, let it be said at once that I approach to the sea to see the heavenly and those celestials cast me deep down below the life into the darkness down. And so, false priest am I, I am to sing abyssally for those who have no ears to hear the warning, anxious terror of the songs. He constantly moved between Greek gods, mostly Greek gods, and, and Greece was of immense import. He tried to import Greece into, into Germany with extremely interesting <laughs> results. Um, but, you know, there, there's so much in that guy that uh, it's, it's really very difficult to, uh, to, to, to make something uh, gel in uh, half an hour. Now, I seem to have lost one bit. That's not good. Um, there's a lot of psychoanalysis in this. There's a lot of philosophy in this. Um, but that I'm not touching on. Okay, I'll do this, number 17. He was very much in love with rivers. He was born and died very close to the Neckar River, which he loved passionately. For him, the rivers carried life backward and forward he loved them dearly as the demigods, brothers and sisters to other demigods, the poets. True that the rivers begin high in some deserted Alps or towering mountains, and true that they work downward as they move towards sea. But in the poetry, you cannot ever trust, cannot ever be sure, a stream for him also does not carry back whatever loads it met on the sea's other side. In fine, a river also is the human mind working in recollection back from ocean into the poet's life. The mind is full of stops, full of remembered latitudes and longitudes of life where the mind's body dwelt for short or longer times and in the recollections, the mind works back to every kind of source, to every stop along the long, long way until it rests a while, looks at deep ocean it has ended in, and can prepare to face a final door, open the door, and sink below the waves, the ships, the islands. Thus I, Poet must take you from Rhine and Danube, far from your native Swabia, to a wider world where sundry rivers run that stop me in my tracks. I take you to the Thames, the Seine, the Po, the Tiber, Petersburg's Neva, and then across old continents, over to Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Irrawaddy, and a vast Mekong, drawing at least three countries into their final sea, then to a Yangtze and a Yellow River, the Baram, the Kinabatangam, and the Rajang in Borneo, then down to the Australian Murray and the Darling, and after this across to Nile, mother of Egypt, and to Zambezi at Victoria, thus the gigantic fall right there in Africa and tropical Brazil, the Shingu and the Amazon, the Paraná, 
up through Volcano County to the Usumashinta part of the Maya into my own country with Mississippi and Missouri and the American-Canadian huge array of falls around. Aha, Niagara. Nah, nor does the count stop there. No, no, far off. After my own demise, mankind will sail among the boundless seas of space, finding the Lord alone knows. Should there be a Lord, how many rivers among his countless planets and the deep stars gone wild beyond all calculation? Did you not sometimes stop to consider this when looking up at your sky full of stars, still pure, unglazed by so much human light? To think of it, the stars also have courses up in the oceanic heavens from which they shine like distant ships carrying gods backwards down to their dwellings. Then human joy in their kindness, their tenderness to them while they suffer the pains of any era and mankind's lack of culture Wisdom, lack of the means to move with satisfaction into other ways, other dimensions, with hearts at rest. I'm damned if I want to get, not find that, that one that I want to do. Ah, jeepers. Well, this is one of the, uh, the love songs for Diotima. It's number 11. I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> now this, the breaking of a master love. Love can be, love can be not. Love can be broken by the gods by fire or water, parents, friends, children, the vagaries of gender, just name the enemy your home. This I, in a green night of Europe, one night out of a thousand nights of hope and young desire in never fading recollection, lie helplessly beside the perfect body well, it will not respond, it will not move, it will not help, it won't reciprocate, and the whole night, alas, goes by, destroyed forever. The subject of a different search, of an experiment in sexuality, a girl's experiment that later broke the hopes of many boys. Decades long gone, never forgotten. One time a potential bride who would not change her faith because my father made a condition of it or did not wish for a new faith. I did not wish. The marriage canceled. Then came one wife, beloved in good time, mother of children, lifelong dearest friend. Then came another utter working companionship, also a life-enhancing friend. He writes, there is a being on this earth, the Athena, the Athenarian. This did I call her first before I named her just Diotima. Oh, clear that beautiful complexion out of Titian. And as I asked another friend, she is a Greek, isn't she? Now, isn't she? As for Diotima in Plato, a Greek philosopher. And it was said that I, this Hildelian stranger, was glad to physically resemble her very brother. She is in exile from her proper times. Truth 
it's impossible to think of earthly things when she is present which is why desperately little can be said of her. I have moved out of suffering of the invisible despair that ate away my life, my work, my very being as a poet I am in a new world. Then, as for I, back in my youth's own time, it is this father, this businessman, this man of finance, yanking the eye, a kid, even when middle-aged into his lair, forbidding him to live the life of poetry or making it so hard, so difficult, another life had to be added on to the basic life, thus weakening that life for many years. Thus it was fated. He had to work below her station, thrown to her company by his too close position, the education of her children. Was he an equal in the house at parties, teas, dinners, conversations, picnics and trips abroad? Or was he but a slightly better servant to be dispensed with when serious together were involved? One such, oh, so much wanted, loved, so much desired, passing close up or reading her some work must have tipped up the scale of his demeanors and he was out. And after that, the fevered letters, the once a week walls, walks by her house, hoping that they could see each other until at last the spell had to be broken. He had to leave her neighborhood. Go down, lovely son. Go down, you lovely son. They paid you scant attention or say, but then the son of spirit, the loveliest of worlds, has set and for all. And whether soon or whether late, the person life must be lodging below the poet life and hope must be abandoned in order to become not only poetry, but no thing else on earth that can be thought of. What are they then to you, O oh song, pure song, those other hopes, those other works. It's true that I shall die, but as for you, you move another way. And now he works as if the climate were permission for the work, as if his youth commissioned him to fame, as if those difficult, hard, painful masters could not make him feel so small, so small, and could go back into their dens when he had called so loud to them for sustenance. Shame on their silence when he asked for help and weary or disgruntled with his pleas, not certain he was in for real, for Germany, they caused him to go back upon his plans. He had to ask for money yet again from a tough ma, a man of 30 some, thus merely asking for his patrimony. He had to worry that one would help the Otima so that her sadness should not be the end of her. For him, if I had tried to say my whole misery, I think I should have wept the soul out of my body and been way gone from hence. The Otima wrote, our love cannot be taken from us. She wrote that our unseen, invisible belongings to each other will last, but your and will continue while life, this life is short. Of course, a lot of stuff mixed in there. There's me, there's she, her, there's ladies I know and live with and so on and so forth. So it all has to be, you know. Okay. Um, what are we doing time-wise? Um, Another 15 minutes or so? 15 minutes? Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering whether, I mean, you know, you might well have had enough of a dose of this. So, uh, you just have to get me back to read the whole thing. <laughs> um, okay. And you 
you can stop anytime you want to. Mm -hmm. Except to show. Hmm? You got, uh, it's 15 minutes, good for you? Okay. Well, um, I thought I might talk just a little bit about uh, Atlantis and autoanthropology. Uh, this is the picture. Uh, you, ladies, you ladies don't go crazy because this was taken in 79 and I was very good looking, but I'm not now. <laughs> so, and you can even have a copy of that photograph. Um, Duke Press, uh, you know, publishers are insane. But Duke Press, uh, not you, not you. No. <laughs> um, they suddenly decided to send 250 of these. And I said, well, you know, uh, I only know about 10 people. <laughs> but then, so they sent this out. So I bought, I bought six here if somebody wants one. Uh, it says, and, and there's a, I shouldn't even say this, but there's a, a special offer. You can get 30% off the paperback. It really comes to very little. Okay, so those are there. Now, what... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm having a laugh, me the depressed. <laughs> um, I don't know when this dance thing started, but it did take 40 years to write. Um, it probably started getting together uh, when I came to the States in 72 to acquire American citizenship on top of all the others that I have. Um, a lot of people would stample on that. But uh, it gradually, I didn't know what it was going to be. I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to write a diary as such, but I did somehow want to write a notebook so that if there was anything important happening, um, I could put it into the, into the notebook. Um, then, just as in the Hodolinii and other things, uh, the question of the double life uh, became very important, more and more, forever. And um, I, I just wanted to be a poet. But um, there was need of food to fill the family. And so um, for 30 years, I was an anthropologist, uh, specializing in religious systems, and uh, my main, I guess my main work for the PhD was in Atitlan in uh, Guatemala. And then later when I already had that, um, Burma. I didn't want to go to Burma. I wanted to go to Tibet or to uh, Japan, uh, Mahayana country, for those of you who know Buddhist studies. And, uh, but there was a job at the um, School of Oriental and African Studies, one of the best university bits in, in the world, in London. And uh, so I, I got a job there teaching. And uh, the reason I got the job, I was at the London School of Economics before that with the great uh, Raymond Firth. And um, he said, now, what are you going to do? I said, I want to go to Japan or Tibet. He said, well, there's a job at SOAS, and you would be perfect for it. I said, well, what's the job? Southeast Asia. Mm, beautiful, 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 but not what I wanted to do. However, I succumbed because there was the job and there was the money to bring back the food. And so I was there for seven years. And it was okay, you know, it was okay. The, the, uh, 
The people in the department were great. The people all over the school were, were fine. I never had any trouble of any kind. But this business of the poetry, the poetry, the poetry. So ultimately, uh, I won't go into details, but uh, life broke in half. And I very nearly destroyed a family. And then I came here. And the irony was that um, I was given a job to teach comparative literature, a discipline in which I totally failed to believe. <laughs> I don't think it exists, quite frankly. <laughs> um, but that's what I did for a few years. And then a very uh, ambitious young uh, archaeologist, a Maya specialist, arrived at that university and within a mm, couple of months or so, I was teaching modern Maya and he was teaching modern, uh, he was teaching ancient Maya. And again, we got on very well. In fact, uh, Janet and I went on a, a, dizzen, uh, a, dizzen, a digging of his uh, in, where, 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 remind me, <laughs> it's a very small country on the on the Pacific. Pacific. That's not bad. Pacific. I like Pacific. The Pacific. No. The the Pacific. The Pacific. I kind of like that Pacific. I got to work on that <laughs> for the kids. Um, so uh, you know, it went on with that and. We had three, uh, no, I had three um, fieldwork years and years and a half um, in Guatemala, but in Burma, it, which was very, very difficult, uh, it was a year and a half. And I can tell you that of all the Southeast Asian peoples, the Burmese are the most difficult. If you actually go to the news and read what has been happening in uh, Burma with the goddamned army, um, you'll see that it's a very, very, very difficult country. It has its loving side, its lovely side. It's very beautiful geographically and so on. But for some reason, the people never seem to get it together since the last royal regime, which was taken over by the Brits, and it became a British uh, colony for quite a long time, until it got independence sometime as a sort of after World War II as a result of all the mixing and rearrangements that were being done. So, uh, This also contains a fair amount of stuff on the work, on various interests which did not actually belong to my discipline or disciplines, but I got interested in. For instance, there's a very long piece which friends of mine have uh, considered to be howlingly funny uh, about the Roman god who uh, goes backwards and goes forwards. Uh, Janus, Janus, J A N U S, I think. And uh, I, I play on that for quite a long chapter. And there are lots of other things of that sort. So it, I, I would venture, I would sort of venture to say that uh, um, it, it's amusing in part. It's it's. Uh, it's, uh, and there you have all sorts of nice photographs and things. It's, um, it's amusing. I think it's amusing. It's also very, very serious about the poetic life. And I go through all my hatreds and my uh, feelings against a lot of things that were happening in the poetry world. So it's, it's worth a read. I know that there are 200 million other books that you probably want to read. 
And that's that's my situation. I have 60,000 60, books at home. Um, now I have to get rid of them and nobody wants to buy them. Um, but in any event, uh, among all those things between covers, I think it's respectable. <laughs> I now leave you with many thanks for being so, so incredibly patient. No, you really were incredibly patient because I think if I'd walked in and tried to listen to this, I would have gone bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my number is over. Let's, let's hear other numbers, if there are any. Does that mean you would like to answer a question or two? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, there's so much I don't know in all of this that uh, I'm scared to death of, of uh, questions because, uh, for instance, I mean, I, I do not believe that I was ever trained as a literary scholar uh, beyond one course when I was about 14, 15, something like that, fell in love with Tennyson, but that wasn't actually a uh, training in, you know, how to write uh, about literature, how to review literature, how to all of those things. So um, in my shame, I, I just uh, basically stay away from, from lit crit because I, I just, uh, some people come up and say, you know, well, what's the matter with you? I mean, why can't you do that? Uh, I said, well, I can't, I, I, I don't know how to do it. How about a question that's not literary? Not literary. Uh, did you meet the Kachin people up in northern Burma? <laughs> I I was going to wear my Kachin. Uh, I don't know how to call it. You know, shoulder bag. Okay. And they have they they're just bright red, and they have this incredible bunch of silver things on the side. Yeah, I went up, uh, they, they were not basically in my brief, but I did travel a huge amount. And I went up to one of the greatest of the, of the Kachin uh, things, which I think it went on for six uh, days. And the, there was some very uh, important uh, killing of uh, animals bulls and so on. But above all, in beauty, there were, there were these extraordinary dances, all the men and all the women going round and round in circles with these, with these uh, silver things clicking, you know, making a wonderful noise, and also trumpets and other, other things. And uh, it, it, was, it was paradisal. I mean, it was like literally... <sighs> I don't want to go romantic on this. I'm just saying, it's just, it was just beautiful, okay? They are having a very hard time with the people I know. in the country. Yeah. You know, the ones down south in All, what we called Rangoon, I guess, at one time. But, uh, all those people. Terrible for, for those different tribes up in that area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, you were... I just, no, I've never been there. You yeah, never. I just happened to know that they were uh, very essential during World War II. Yeah. And, uh, aiding uh, the defense of that area. Yeah. Well, the big problem, you know, politically is that the, the army has, the army feels that it's never stopped being the, the, the leaders. And uh, now that so many of those other, let's say tribes, I mean, they, they obviously have all their names, um, the more they uh, get together against and there's a lot of traffic, for instance, that goes from uh, Burma itself, the main Burma, right. into the forests and over to Thailand. They can escape to Thailand, they, they can come back, you know, all, all of that stuff. So while well, all that uh, dislike of the army has become really violent because 
they have committed awful, incredible crime. You know, they've been well, 40, 50, it's like Putin's Russia at the moment. The Chechens are very good at taking care of themselves. They are. But yeah. I, I, when you were doing your poetry, I was thinking of uh, Dante. I, I just had that. I seemed like he was all around me. <laughs> uh -huh. and well, that's uh, Dante is. Um, and his lost love. Pardon? And his lost love. His Speaking lost love. Yes. You know, so. yes. Thousands, indeed millions of pages. Uh, studying that lost love. I came across something the other day which uh, by a poet who said he didn't want, he had done to the, Purga, he had uh, translated the Purgatorio, okay? And a friend of his said, you, why don't you do the, the upper level? So <laughs> he said, no, I don't really like it because, um, and then he named one or two things and one of them was, <laughs> He didn't like Beatrice, for God's sake. <laughs> I, mean, I adore Beatrice. What was that about? But he didn't, you know. And there was one other thing he didn't like. Um, I can't remember this point. Oh, you know, as for, it's got to be for all sorts. I'm sorry I couldn't read you that what I call the political thing, because it's all about the exploitation of the earth in this country at this point, uh, and the movement to uh, do better with, uh, with uh, the uh, the bettering of the of the pl of the planet. It, I am at this point in a, in a totally broken mind because it happens that my mother was Ukrainian. Uh, she was taken by her mother to Paris when she was two. So I'm Ukrainian to a certain extent. Um, what I cannot cope with for myself is that all my life I've been passionate about Russia, passionately in love with, with Russia. And this swine, you know, this, this thing. He's Georgian. Yeah. So how do you love, you know, this and Russia? But you can also go way back and love some things about that and about this, and you know suddenly it changes around. So mixed up, isn't it? I, I, I have a hard time with that. It's like a metamorphic rock. What? It's like a metamorphic rock. Yeah. Okay. Well, if everybody's asleep, we can. Uh... <laughs> I, have a question. I have a question for you. you Okay. So you said in the in the poems, some of it is you speaking to Friedrich and him speaking to you. How much, um, how much of the text is drawn from his poems? Oh, were you including that te yes. textually? Is yes, it a yes. mixture of his words and yours? No, quite quite right. There are some translations uh -huh. in the book. Uh, but they are chosen and framed, uh, you know, to, to the purpose of the whole book. Okay. And so, or the purposes of the whole book. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, in that long piece that I read about uh, uh, taking a holiday, um, I think that if I remember rightly, but it all sort of drained into me to such an extent that I, in the end I couldn't, I really didn't know what was translation. Wow. You know, if you, if you were to get hold of the book and open and point to something, I might very well be in the position of not knowing whether that was me or him. And, well, this might, this might amuse you. Um, while 
this was beginning, or even just before it appeared, I was trying to write an anthro-literary book on the Maya, uh, and particularly on the archaeology, because I had done, I, I was very interested all through the late part of my uh, job thing, uh, I was very interested in trying to get away from jargon in anthropology. It's interesting because now that I'm not in there, they're all talking about that. Not due to me, but just evolution, okay? Well, um, okay, so this is, I suppose, the revelation of uh, something, but I don't know how or when exactly, but suddenly I was in a love affair with H. And um, it was obviously not sexual, but it was unbelievably strong, okay? And I mean, I had, uh, I was thinking of him all day and so on and so forth, and reading him all day and reading people about him and so on and so forth. And so uh, it was very strange because I had to put the Maya thing to bed and I haven't brought it out of bed yet, and I don't know whether I'll be able to. Um, but that took over completely. I've, I've never, I don't think I've ever been taken over by a book in the way, although I'm sure that, you know, when I was a kid and read Dante or whatever, you know, I, I probably had the same kind of thing. I used to when I finished a book, I always used to kiss the book if, if, it, if I thought it was good and important and part of me and all the rest of it. Um, so, and, I, and I've always been a book maniac. I mean, I buy, even now when I'm supposed to be selling my books, uh, I, I buy them every week, you know. I can't, I can't say, it's, I'm, I'm drugged. I'm literally drugged as far as books are concerned. We, <laughs> the story of, your friend, Charles, uh, we were in the, the great park up there, which I was so happy to see again, the, the nature history part, you know, uh, park, sorry. And I bought a whole bunch of uh, postcards and so on and so forth. And then uh, Charles whipped out a book and said, this is very important. And I took a look at it and I thought, Yes, it definitely is important. <laughs> but then I said to Charles, listen, kiddo, I mean, I'm not going to do this, you know, because, <laughs> because God damn it, I can't go on buying books. <laughs> so uh, seven minutes went by, eight minutes went by. I grabbed the book and went and bought it. <laughs> what, what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> I used to say to my parents, who would, uh, as you may have gathered from the book, The H, that uh, they didn't see me as a scholar, they didn't, they didn't send me, see me as anything except basically a business person. And um, there was something about buying books or something. One day, I just, oh, there are women, there are horses. I have nothing to do with them. I do books. You bloody well please. <laughs> so, that's the story. <laughs> Do you guys want to say anything about all this nonsense, or are you kind of wanting to go home? It's so beautiful. It's really beautiful. Just yeah. the language of it is so beautiful. So angry? Beautiful. Oh, you said beautiful. I thought I, I, thought I heard the word angry. <laughs> language. Oh, language. You see, I'm, a, I'm incredibly negative. 
Okay, well, let's go on living. There you go.